This is Lesson 3 for Module 2, Wind Turbine Performance. I will discuss blade pitch control systems, specifically the devices and methods of actuation, the types, and closed loop control systems. Also, power and performance characteristics and performance coefficients. Blade pitching results in less lift, more drag, lower tip speed, and therefore slower rotor revolutions. Turbine blades are pitched in order to reduce the rotor's RPM when the wind speed is unfavorable or when little or no power output is required from the turbine. As you can see in the diagram, the front view of the rotor, um, it's assumed that the blades are at the critical angle and the velocity and torque are at the maximum. As the pitch is adjusted, the surface area of the blade that the wind comes into contact with is decreased. This lowers the torque on the blade and decreases the velocity of the rotor. As it's pitched even more, the area, surface area decreases one, again and the velocity would decrease also. This is done rather than facing the blades into the wind causing stress on it. They are turned in a way almost like your hand being out flat or laying I guess horizontal out a car window. It doesn't have any lift it just sort of goes by the streamline shape of your hand when it's laid um, flat. That's what's being done with uh, the blade when it's at quarter pitch and so on. The pitch actuator of the wind turbine blade may be hydraulic, electrical, or mechanical. Here is a double acting hydraulic cylinder that pivots the blade. The double acting cylinder has force as it extends and force as it retracts and it is used in conjunction with a lever system to rotate the will pivot the blade an electric motor drive is used um, along with a, a gear system inside of the blade at the root to also pitch the blades. The electric motor is connected to a reduction drive and that increases the torque and decreases the RPM at the output shaft that comes into contact with the large ring gear mounted inside the root of the blade. Both of these systems, the hydraulic and the electrical, require a control system and they are considered an active system, that's what they're called. A type of passive system is the mechanical blade pitch control system. Basically it uses centrifugal forces to adjust the pitch of the blade. The active systems would require sensor, uh, sensors such as the anemometers to monitor the wind speed and also sensors to um, give information on the position, relative position of the the blade pitch and they the PLC and all of this input information can be used to adjust the blade and keep the blade at the critical angle for, ver uh, for various wind speeds. The mechanical blade pitch control more or less is just for prevention of the blades over speeding. It's not as um, it's not a, an involved system, and so it is seen on uh, less ex expensive and uh, smaller wind turbine systems.
passive pitch control is also called passive stall control. There is a difference. Passive stall control is where the blades are connected to the hub at a fixed angle. If the winds are too strong, the design of the blade itself prevents the rotor from produce from uh, prevents the blade from producing too much torque and overspeeding the rotor. There are no additional moving parts to fail and no expensive control systems are associated with those systems. However, this makes the overall performance of the wind turbine less efficient at lower speeds also. In active pitch control, the pitch of the turbine blade is changed to a point at which the airfoil on each blade stalls and this action is controlled by the control system. This control can also be used to pitch the blades during startup or when wind speed is low. This makes the wind turbine more efficient over a wide range of wind speeds in comparison to passive control. And Passive control relies just on um, like spring tension, the counterweights, and it doesn't provide um, continuous monitoring of wind speeds and adjustments, uh, um, continuous adjustments. Um, also, another the other type of passive control is just the stall control where the blade itself is designed to um, basically quit um, producing torque at a certain RPM and that makes them less efficient but also less complicated. In smaller applications, a mechanical system changes the pitch of the blades using springs and weights. This is really a passive system as it does not rely on the use of a control system. When wind is strongest, spring tension changes the blade pitch to slow down the rotor. This can be accomplished by an, a linkage between the blade root and the um, counterweight system. The centrifugal forces cause the blade to be pitched when turning near the unsafe speed, and this design is explained on the next two slides. So rather than passive stall, this is a type that's also passive, it's called passive mechanical. Mechanical blade pitch control prevents the windmill or wind turbine from overspeeding, and it does this by utilizing the um, centrifugal forces acting upon the weight. Um, in case you're unfamiliar with centrifugal forces, um, it's what's felt when you're on a merry-go-round. Let's say you're sitting at the edge of it, and you feel the force trying to throw you off the merry-go-round. Um, that's the centrifugal force. And as the wind turbine uh, speeds up, the rotor speeds up, the weights pull outward acting against the spring tension uh, just like when you're on America round and someone would turn it faster it really feels like you're going to be thrown off of it if you don't hang on and that's the forces that are acting against these counterweights. The diagram at left indicates the rotation of the rotor, the centrifugal forces acting on the weight, and the spring's expansion force. During the event the turbine begins to overspeed, the weight will pull harder and harder outward to the right in the steel diagram. This outward force will act upon the weight and will eventually overcome the spring's expansion force, so as the wind turbine begins to increase its rotation, this weight will pull with greater and greater force outward and it will act against the expansion force of this spring. So you can see the weight's connected to this blue rod and the rod is connected to this lever and the pivot point is at the root of the blade. So when this occurs, the blue bar will begin to move outward, which is right to the right in the diagram allowing the blade to be pitched far past the critical point, reducing the surface area of the blade coming into contact with wind. This reduces the torque and slows it down. 
The diagram at right shows a two blade design and how each control is oriented to keep it balanced. You can see the two blade system and the counterweight systems are mounted opposite of one another to keep it balanced. I know this first drawing shows the incoming one coming in from the top so it appears like it's rotating about a vertical axis but I just rotated it um, to the left basically 90 degrees so that it would correlate with the merry-go-round analogy. Um, with specific designs, um, maybe variations in spring force, maybe multiple springs, and um, also other setups that are a, a little more elaborate than this one, um, the blade can be kept somewhat within the critical angle uh, for different wind speeds. Here are a few videos that are on YouTube. Uh, the first one is the me uh, mechanical blade pitch control animation and it, it's a design that uses the mass of the blades as the counterweights which is pretty interesting. So rather than using counterweights which is just additional mass on there they use the, the mass of the blades um, as, the, as the counterweight. Also, um, is a, here's a comparison of the active systems, the hydraulic and electric blade pitch control. It's just a, a, a document, rather. Okay, so remembering with an active system, it um, uses monitoring and um, computer systems to ensure that the blade is at the critical angle for the wind speed and it's also used to um, pitch the blades to a point past the critical angle so that the blade will not over speed during high winds and also during winds that are not high enough or not great enough rather um, it allows for the wind to just pass by the blades without putting stress on them so if the system the system is shut down, um, it, it prevents the stress on the blades. So the going to the motor drive system, the motor drive turns a small gear, which turns the blades ring gear, as discussed earlier. A little bit um, better drawing, cutaway view, or better image rather. You see the motor drive here. It goes through a reduction gearbox and here is the output gear and it drives the basically ring gear mounted at the in uh, mounted inside the root of the blade and of course there would be a, a means of allowing the blade to be attached to the hub and rotate but the basic concept is illustrated here Okay, blade pitch control systems. Controlling the blade pitch is accomplished by using a control system. The basic control system has two inputs and one output. The first input to the controller comes from the anemometer, which monitors the wind speed. The second from the blade pitch position sensor, so it knows where the blade's at. The controlled program must decide whether to keep the device off or activate it in the forward or reverse direction. If the wind speed is below the set point, the device is disabled. If the wind speed surpasses the set point, the program will activate the device in the forward direction causing the blades to stall. When the wind speed goes below the set point, the program must activate the device in the reverse direction, allowing the blades to catch the wind once more. The 
This design also incorporates a, posi a position sensor to indicate the present pitch angle. The system makes assumptions on previous conditions. Um, an example of that would be if the wind speed is too low um, to utilize, then the system must put the blades into the stall position if not already there. If it's already there and the wind speeds are low, then it needs to keep it there. The only time that it's going to change and allow it to catch the wind is when the wind speed goes into the set point. So there are a lot of different conditions with it. Also, if the wind speed becomes too great, it needs to pitch the blades to maybe quarter pitch or something like that, maybe a little more, and possibly apply a braking system so that it doesn't overspeed the rotor. Once it does that, it still has to check are the conditions okay, has it is are the wind sustained and what present position are the blades in. So there's a lot to consider with these control systems. One design consideration would be how long the controller should wait before taking action. For example, if winds were just gusting past the set point, it would not be wise to allow the controller to constantly actuate the blade pitch motor. A suitable delay should be programmed into the system in an effort to prevent this erratic behavior. So you wouldn't want it to constantly activate the pitch control motor, the, the motor drive, or the hydraulic system if it had a hydraulic uh, system in it. You wouldn't want the controller to constantly activate it um, when the wind, say, gust, would gust maybe five or ten miles per hour for maybe a second or two. It would need to wait to make sure that the the wind is either going to sustain that speed or it's just a wind gust. There would be a lot of um, wasted power pitching the blades with this control system um, every time the wind changed speed, which it, it never really stays exactly the same. Um, can you think of any other design considerations? Another blade pitch control system involves what is called a control loop. The set point is the maximum speed at which the blades can rotate. A feedback sensor measures the RPM of the rotor. Another blade pitch control system involves what is called a control loop. The set point is the maximum speed at which the blades can rotate. A feedback sensor measures the RPM of the rotor. The set point and feedback signal are compared in the summing junction and the amount of deviation from the set point is sent to a programmable logic controller. The PLC, which is a computer device, sends a signal to a hydraulic amplifier which changes the pressure and flow and that controls the blade pitch by basically um, holding the position of the blade pitch uh, cylinder. The RPM of the rotor is constantly compared to that set point, and this type of control allows for real-time monitoring of the turbine blades. And since the hydraulic system can react fairly quickly, you need to wait for like in a, an electric system for the motor to you know, spool down or anything like that. It's a quick quick action uh, system. And looking at the diagram, you see the rotor shaft, which would be the low speed shaft, and the rotor speed sensor, and that signal goes to the controller. And if the rotor shaft speed is too high, in other words it's above the set point that's been programmed into the controller, the controller will activate the hydraulic amplifier and adjust the blade pitch. This would also be used in conjunction with an anemometer, but it's not included in here. It makes it a little less complicated to look at. 
and that would go into the controller as well and it would adjust the hydraulic amplifier to um, adjust the hydraulic system and put keep the blade near the critical angle. We will get into the uh, more details on this type of system in uh, future classes. Power and performance. The amount of power a turbine can harness from the wind is given by the power availability formula. The power output is directly proportional to the swept area of the blades, the wind density, and the wind velocity. The swept area of the blades means the area that the blades pass through. Um, if you picture a box fan or a ceiling fan running at a high speed, if you're to look at it head on, it looks almost like um, a disc or a circle. The area within there is the swept area of the blades. Uh, the wind density is basically the thickness of the air and the wind velocity is its speed. And we're assuming the direction of it is straight into the rotor swept area. So the available power from the wind that's not the power of at the rotor, it's just the power of the wind passing through that swept area is given by the formula um, derived um, with, through dynamics and its power available is equal to one half rho AV cubed where rho is the density of the air in kilograms per cubic meter A is the rotor swept area in square meters and V is the wind velocity in meters per second. This equation was um, derived using metric, uh, the metric system, so all everything that uh, plugs into the equation um, is a uh, part of the metric system. The swept area is found by the equation for the area of a circle because it is a, a, takes on a disk shape and the area equals pi r squared where a is the area pi is the relationship between the circle's diameter and its circumference and r is one half the rotor diameter <coughs> or for this lesson approximately the blade's length Using the equations from the previous slide, find the available power for a wind turbine having three blades or having blades three meters long. These blades are harnessing power from the wind with a velocity of 9.6 meters per second and a density of 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. So the available power, not the power of the rotor, but the, the power of the wind passing through it, uh, is first calculated by getting the rotor swept area which is the length of the blade squared times pi which is 28.27 square meters so putting that into the power availability formula one half rho AV cubed you will get one half times 1.2 kilograms per meter cube times 28.27 meters square times 9.6 meters cubed and this calculation must be done first you take 9.6 cubed or 9.6 times 9.6 times 9.6 and then multiply that by 28.27 then multiply that by 1.2 and multiply that by 0.5 and you should get around 15 kilowatts or 15,000 watts
How much more power could be attained if the wind velocity increased to 12 meters per second? Well, this would be the power available for scenario two. It goes into the equation one half row AV cubed equals one half. And we're assuming that the density of the air has not changed. So it's still multiplied by 1.2 kilograms. And then by the rotor swept area, it's the same wind turbine, so the air, rotor swept area is not changed. And then multiply it by 20 meters per second cubed. So in order to do this calculation, like on the calculator, it would be 20 cubed, or 20 times 20 times 20, multiplied by 28.27, multiplied by 1.2, multiplied by 0.5. And you should get around 29.3 kilowatts or 29,300 watts. So if you look at this, the available power, the, the power of the wind um, actually doubled with a, let's see, 9.6 to 12, with about a 35 or so percent increase, maybe 30 percent increase in wind speed. So. Um, 30% increase in the wind resulted in twice the power being available. Um, even though the wind speed increased only slightly, uh, the output nearly doubled. All right, so an introduction to coefficients. We get into the performance coefficient or the correction factor for the rotor so we can actually find the power at the rotor rather than the power that's available um, as far as the wind, the, um, the power of the wind itself. The previous available power equation showed us the actual dynamic power equivalent of the wind passing through the rotor. However, not all of this power is attainable or usable by the wind turbine. This is due to the fact that the blades are not able to occupy this area all at one time and therefore cannot harness all of the wind's power. So a coefficient must be used to represent the lack of a blade's ability to harness all of the power within its given swept area. So the coefficient is like the correction factor. It shows the efficiency of the wind turbine rotor. So the equation changes to power at the rotor rather than power available is equal to one half row AV cubed C subscript P, where C subscript P is the performance or power coefficient of the turbine rotor. And this would be the available power at the rotor rather than the available power of the wind. The Betts limit. German physicist Albert Betts posited that only a certain amount of the wind's energy can be harnessed by a wind turbine. His work utilized conservation of mass, and his work states that no more than 16 27 of the wind's energy is ever utilized by any type of wind turbine. The maximum power attainable was found by calculating how much of the wind's energy may be captured by a solid disk, and the solid disk represents the blade's overall swept area. Since the blades can't actually occupy the area all at one time, um, we know that the power that's attainable by a wind turbine is less than 16 27ths. As you can see in the diagram, velocity 1 is the incoming wind speed, and this would be looking at the rotor from a profile view. So the wind speed comes in at velocity 1, whatever that may be, and it slows down to velocity 2 as it comes into contact with the disk. Part of the wind would, um, there would be a little bit of friction with the surface of the disk, and it would flow around the disk, creating a lower pressure, pressure 3, and also a different velocity, a lower velocity, and it would be um, turbulence as well and the final exiting velocity, that is the velocity of the wind once it has um, been utilized by this imaginary disk. 
There are also different pressures that are involved in this calculation. The pressure of the wind um, as it normally is and the pressure of it when it comes into contact with the disc and the lower pressure on the other side of the disc. As you could imagine there would be a great disturbance in the wind as it came into contact with this disc and not all of the force would actually push upon the disc. A lot of it would just um, really bypass or kind of push around the edge of the disc. And through a series of complex uh, calculations, only 16 27 of that overall power from the wind um, is actually exerted upon the disc. Putting it all together with the power equation, adding in the fact that some energy and therefore power is lost by the friction of bearings and losses associated with the changing of mechanical power into electrical power, as with using the electric generator, the final equation for the actual output becomes power output equals one half rho AV cubed C subscript P C subscript G, where C subscript G is the performance coefficient of the drivetrain, gearbox, and generator as a whole. This equation describes the actual available output power or electrical power coming from the turbine's generator. Also remember that according to the Betts limit, no more than 16 27 or 59 percent of the wind's dynamic power can ever be utilized by the turbine. And that's not really a problem since the wind is free anyway. This means that CP will never be greater than 59% or 0.59 as a decimal. The inefficiencies due to friction and design cause an additional performance loss. And that's what designers are trying to maximize. The most amount of power op output for the um, size of the, the rotor, the diameter of the rotor. Okay, to uh, recap, the final power output equation is one half rho AV cubed, that's the available power um, of the wind, or the power um, available from the wind. CP is the performance coefficient of the wind turbine, and that would be um, specified by the manufacturer. and CG is the um, basically the efficiency of the drivetrain and um, the generator. So as an example, if a drivetrain, gearbox, and generator lose 12 percent of the overall rotor's power, it would be said to have an efficiency of 88 percent. So if 12 percent is being lost, then overall 88 percent of the power from the rotor is passing to become electrical power. And of course the performance coefficient will be at its maximum if the wind speed is within range and the blade is kept at its critical angle for that wind speed. Uh, you may be wondering why the overall power output formula does not um, include the number of blades um, that's figured in with the performance coefficient that's specified from the manufacturer, the design, all that stuff is tested in a lab. And also with the available power formula, it doesn't really matter how many blades there are because it doesn't include um, the rotor power, it's just taking a look at how much power is available from the wind itself. Okay, so using the equation discussed on the previous slide, find the available power if the overall performance of the rotor, 
subscript C subscript P is 40 percent and the efficiency within the turbine is about 90 percent so into the formula for power overall power output it's equal to one half row AV cube CPCG so that equals one half 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed times 28.27 square meters times 9.6 meters per second cubed times 0.4 times 0.9 you should get around 5.4 kilowatts so even though the kinetic power of the wind turbine um, uh, of the wind itself is 15 kilowatts the available output of this example is about five and a half kilowatts so that means about one-third of the available input um, when uh, power from the wind is actually used Another example, find the output power of a large wind turbine with blades 40 meters long, a specified performance coefficient of 41%, remember it has to be less than the bed's limit, and an internal efficiency of about 90%, which is pretty good. And it's encountering 10 meter per second winds having a density of 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter, so we'll find the power at that instant for that wind speed. Um, we'll find the power for that wind speed, sustained wind speed. So power output equals one half row AV cubed CPCG. That would be one half times 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter times 5,026 and a half meters cubed. Remember that's found from pi r squared, so 40 square, 40 times 40 times pi, and you should get 5,026 and a half or some, something close to that and that's multiplied by 10 meters per second cubed multiplied by 41 percent efficiency and um, 90 percent of the drivetrain and generator efficiency um, multiplying that on the calculator you do the 10 meters cubed first so 10 times 10 times 10 which is 100 and then multiply that by 5026 and a half remember this has already been square so I don't have to do that again this is a square measurement, the area, and then multiply it by 1.2, uh, multiply it by 0.5, and multiply by 0.41 and 0.9, and you should get 1.1 megawatts, or 1,100,000 watts, when rounded. what would be the available power of the wind for this example really in order to get back to that original equation that's one half rho AV cube and that ignores the um, losses and inefficiencies due to the design and the bets limit um, the way to do that, the simplest way, since we already have the answer, would be to take 1,112,867 watts and divide it by 0.9 and divide it by 0.41 and that will give us the regular power availability. So you may pause this video and I will give you the answer for that. Okay, so um, if you did that on the calculator, the power available, uh, the power available, in other words, the power of the wind passing through that swept area, would be around three million watts or three megawatts. Here's another example: find the output power of a large wind turbine with blades 60 feet long, a performance coefficient, or CP, of 37 percent and an internal efficiency of 87 percent and it's encountering 27 mile per hour winds having a density of 2.02 pounds per cubic yard now this is different because we're using standard measures rather than metric so we must do um, 
must convert those. Uh, the conversions are 1 meter is 1250 380 first feet, 1 kilogram per meter cube is 0 0.0075 pounds per cubic yard, 1 meter per second is 2.237 miles per hour. So if you look at this, this is in a, a system that most of us would understand a lot better than the metric system. Um, if you're looking at this 2.02 .02 pounds per cubic yard and you're thinking to yourself, wow, air doesn't seem to be, uh, seem to weigh that much. I, I've had a box, you know, that was approximately a cubic yard and it has air in it and I lifted it and it didn't seem very heavy. It didn't seem like it weighed two additional pounds. And the reason why is the air that would be in the box has the same density as the air around the box, so it's buoyant in a way. The air that's within it is um, the same thickness as the outside. It would be similar to taking a box, you know, the, maybe a plastic box or something, and putting it into a pool. If you put the box into a pool um, and you submerse it, the water within the box would be the same density as the water on the outside of the box so it would not increase its weight. It's the same thing with air. So even though you don't think of it, air does have um, mass and therefore weight. So the the air is basically, I guess it's not really buoyant, but it's suspended in the air that's around it. So a box of course that has a cubic yard of air and it doesn't seem to weigh much because it's the same thickness as the air around the box. Uh, anyway, getting back to it, um, we need to know conversions in order to convert this uh, over and plug it into the um, conversion factors. One foot is 381 1250th meters so 60 feet is approximately 18.24 meters, just by multiplication and simpli uh, simplifying the fraction. One pound per cubic yard is 0.5933 kilograms per meter cubed, so 2.02 .02 pounds per yard cubed is the 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. I just converted it over as an example. So now you understand the 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed is the same as 2.02 .02 pounds per cubic yard. It's the same density of air. That's what the density of air is, I believe, at like room temperature at sea level. One mile per hour is 0.447 meters per second. So 27 miles per hour is 12 meters per second. The area is found by pi r squared. So it's pi times 18.24 meters, and that's 1,045.2 meters square. So you multiply this out times pi, and you get the area. Power output is one half rho AV cubed CPCG. So that's one half 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed times 1,045.2 meters square or square meters times 12 meters per second cubed times the 0.37 times 0.87 that was given by the efficiencies and you should come up with around 350 kilowatts so if and you want to go by the standard system since the equation was derived using the metric system there's a lot of steps to go through to convert everything from our US measures over to metric okay performance coefficients examples of performance characteristics the diagram at right describes the power co coefficient CP and what is called the torque coefficient CM of various wind turbines and also a common windmill for different wind speeds. A is an example of a Savanius coefficient. If you look at A, you can see its performance coefficient is here. It meet, uh, reaches a maximum at around 
one meter per second. A uh, common windmill is B. It's a little bit better at around one meter per second. A four blade windmill is C. You can see it doesn't have, and we're assuming that it's the um, very similar rotor diameter. You can see that C doesn't really have as much maximum power and it's achieved at around two meters per second. So at a relatively low wind speed. The three blade design has a lot more um, perform, has way better performance at a slightly higher rate. And the two blade is a little bit um, better near the bets limit, getting close to it for this example design. And the two blade design seems to reach the maximum efficiency at around eight. And that makes sense if you look at the fact that this is a two blade design and this is a three blade design. As mentioned in the previous lecture, a three blade design, since it has three blades on it, it has, um, and each blade is producing torque, it requires less RPM to produce approximately the same amount of power. A two blade design will require higher wind speeds to reduce to produce the same amount of power as a similar three blade design. So you can see here that E produces its well its efficiency or basically its power if you want to look at it that way um, as far as the power availability formula goes. Its efficiency is a little bit better, its design. And this one's very similar, but it achieves almost the same amount at a lower wind speed because it has more blades. So it has more torque, and since power is torque as a rate, the three blade design will require lower wind speeds, lower RPM, to produce approximately the same amount of torque as the two blade design at a higher RPM. Also, if you notice, the, the torque coefficient of the windmill is pretty good but it's really good at a very low wind speed and then drops off fairly quickly. Whereas the two and three blade designs have a more sustained amount of torque through a varying amount of wind speeds or a range of wind speeds. Okay, so key terms for this lesson. Active control systems, which would be like hydraulic and, and motor drive systems that are used to control pitch. Also, Albert Betts and the Betts limit, and that states that due to the design of a wind, of a turbine blade and the number of blades, and the fact that the blades cannot occupy the rotor, the swept area, all at one time, the power basically that can be harnessed from the wind is similar to that of the power that could be harnessed from a, uh, by a disc and that's still limited to 16 27 or 59 percent of the wind's dynamic energy. Also closed loop control systems, coefficients and what they're used for such as um, just correction factors, design factors, efficiencies, also control systems in general, um, control loops, uh, different uh, concepts about controllers, the PLC, computer controlling, and how it ties into active control systems. Also drivers, those are um, devices that are used to power um, equipment Um, directly. Um, an example of a driver would be maybe a, a relay or a small voltage would control a larger current um, and that um, has to do with uh, controllers. A PLC or even a, a computer system cannot control a large electric motor um, directly so there must be a driver device in between there. It could be a contactor or something like that.
passive control and that would be um, passive stall which is the design of the blade um, which is where the design of the blade prevents it from overspeeding and producing too much torque and it also has um, really bad performance um, characteristics because of that. Um, also with passive control would be the mechanical control and that uses counterweights to keep it near its critical angle and prevent it from overspeeding. Um, also key, key terms would be the performance. Also pitch actuators such as the electrical which would be motor drives, hydraulic systems and mechanical actuation. The power availability formula and also the, the power at the, uh, the overall power formula. Sensors, the, a set point, and the rotor swept area. Okay, so this is the end of um, Unit 4. Should have the reading finished or um, nearly done. Also, the wind turbine um, designs PowerPoint from last week had an, a, as a checkup with it. And that com that quiz should be should have been completed last week, or earlier this week, excuse me. And the assignments, um, of course, the readings, and the checkup for this lesson, and complete the module two lesson three quiz, and the test over the entire module two, and it is it's comprehensive. That's all.